Yeah, I think memory probably is like one of the biggest problems right now because it just it limits everything you do with LMs. And I think if people want to work on something that's going to be like really impactful with LMs, maybe it's like either uh, focus on tool use or memory. I think those two things like will have immediate impact for what people are building. Welcome to Humans of AI, where we tell the real stories of those who are building an AI or are making use of it in their daily lives. Today's guest is Charles Packer, a current fifth year PhD student at UC Berkeley and author of MemGPT an open source project teaching large language models to manage their own memory for unbounded context. Charles is also a core member of the Berkeley Artificial Intelligence Research Lab and Real-Time Intelligence Secure Explainable Systems Lab, where his work has spanned reinforcement learning and autonomous driving. If you want to catch the latest episodes of the Humans of AI podcast, make sure to subscribe and check out my free AI newsletter, Chaos Theory, and find me on social at Alex Chowmander. Now, without further ado, Here's my talk with Charles. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Alex. I'm joined here with Charles. He is a fifth-year PhD student at UC Berkeley and the author of uh, MemGPT, a uh, recent pro- AI project, open source on GitHub. That's uh, a key part of what could be the future of AI infrastructure. At least that's what I would describe. But Charles, I'm sure the audience and people listening would love to hear just your story, just how you came to be, and even just what drew you to studying AI in the first place. Yeah, I, well, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, I guess maybe just to go over my the course of my PhD, I guess it's not too far back, but I started doing my PhD actually around the time when RL was extremely hot and like everyone was really, really big on RL. Um, as a student, I obviously like that was one of the main things I was interested in working on. This is also around the same time that like Meta RL was super big. Uh, for anyone familiar with like the the RL space, uh, and yeah, that's basically what I did for the first uh, few years of my PhD. Um, I kind of pivoted uh, then to more autonomous driving focused research. It was a little bit of RL, but more focused on just like model-based planning, basically. Um, not quite, you know, the AV kind of research you'll see out of industry is very much still theoretical, trying to wrestle with a lot of problems to do with like human level planning, you know, like nested planning. How do you humans kind of roll at stop signs and how do they make decisions when things are occluded? Those sorts of problems with studying it inside like a simulator, not actually doing it in a real car. And that's actually kind of just what I was doing until... Um, Last year when GPT-4, Bali 1 and 2 came out. And yeah, so I have, well, if you go back to my publication history to my PhD, it's mostly like autonomous driving research. And like I said, when GPT-4 came out, well, also Dali a little bit earlier than that, I started to think a little bit more about other stuff that was going on in, in ML at the time. Took a little bit of a break from AV research and started playing around with like, the models that were coming out. You know, OpenAI at the time was still releasing code on GitHub so you could like download their latest stuff and play with it. And yeah, eventually that kind of led me towards MemGBT. But um, I don't know if you want to go back even further than that like, PhD or... Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear. Like, I, I think I'd be curious to hear like what are the sort of influences or influencers, right? If there are people or projects mm-hmm. or even just sources of inspiration to even like draw you to... Because a PhD is a commitment, right? And it's, yeah. you're, you know, you could very well be in industry working and just probably making a little bit more money than you are yeah. in, in your program. But I think there's a draw towards at least doing research, doing it at, you know, the top institutions. Uh, so I'd be curious, right, if you were to, yeah, just dial it back to like even earlier Charles Packer. But what did that yeah. look like? <laughs> yeah, I guess we want to go all the way back. Let's briefly talk about like I got into coding I believe when I was in like middle school high school but I, I went to high school um, that didn't like have AP computer science or anything um, so I got into coding from looking like Minecraft servers and Minecraft was super big at the time <laughs> so that was like my first little coding adventure uh, but yeah I guess in college uh, when I was studying computer science there was kind of a point where I decided that I wanted to maybe do a PhD as opposed to go work at, I'd like done internships at like Microsoft, for example, as a software engineer. And I, I think actually another interesting part about the story is that this, when I was like coming to PhD programs is also when things were taking off in terms of deep learning hype. So this is, yeah, kind of maybe 2015, 16, 17, 
a lot of really big papers coming out at this point in time. So I think a lot of people that are my age, or at least were in college at the time, were probably thinking similar things like, hey, like this really crazy stuff coming out of the AI research labs right now. And all the people doing this research are PhD holders. And maybe what the other option you're looking at is going into much more like traditional SWE kind of thing. So building, I don't think like ML engineering was really a thing at the time. So it was kind of like you either maybe go do a PhD to study AI or masters or something, or you can go work on search or some other like more product style things as a software engineer. And yeah, I kind of, I, I, I think basically my junior year of college, I decided like, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to stop doing these software engineering internships. I'm going to try to get into like a research program to do AI research. And I actually took two years. I, I started kind of late in the process and it's pretty competitive to get into grad school. It was back in the day and it's even worse now, I'm sure. <laughs> so, you know, they almost like want you to have done a little PhD before you start the PhD. And I definitely, I was starting really late. I'd done zero research at the time. So I did have to, uh, I applied. I didn't really get into the programs I really wanted to go to. So I wasn't thinking about it too seriously. Everything got really rushed. And I spent two years doing research actually at Berkeley um, with another professor. And that research was like AI. It was still AI. Maybe it was like a little bit more data science, AI adjacent. Then I eventually uh, applied again. And that's when I ended up deciding to come to Berkeley and do AI research. This is the timeline of this is really coinciding with a lot of like the initial AI hype that I'm sure a lot of us remember, like the Carpathy blogs that were doing a character-based RNN. I remember that like went super viral. Then yeah, like AlphaGo, all these things are like happening in real time as I'm kind of deciding to do an AI PhD. Yeah, I mean, I remember those times very uh, fondly. Uh, I think my my own path was uh, to go more the industry route, but I was very fortunate to even dive into autonomous driving, working at places like Uber. It was this right time of not just research, but actually like a lot of money being poured in industry to try to like build what at least at the time was they the I remember the CEO of Uber was like oh there's this existential threat from from Google and we have to really like invest and build stuff and I think very fortunately for me right yeah I was able to enter in or break into that space and yeah working at the the frontier you know, certainly more applied less less like pure research that's the the journey that that we all kind of arc on. You know, one thing that I'd love to hear more about is like, what are your thoughts on, because a big part of even what you were saying was that things like content, whether it be blog posts, maybe some open source projects, right? Uh, have been like a big, a big part of, of your own appreciation, but also your own like tinkering and exploring a lot of these tools, techniques and and problems. What would you say, like, how, how does open source even influence the way you are currently doing and approaching uh, things? It's, yeah, it's kind of a great time to do anything open AI or anything AI tinkering related right now. Because there's just such an abundance of projects being done around, not just open AI, API or other closed companies' APIs, uh, which are also really great to like prototype your own stuff with. Um, but there's just so much being done around running local models now. If you have a recent MacBook that has like an M1 or M2 chip, you can run like incredibly good models that are basically the quality of GPT 3.5 Turbo on your MacBook that, and it will decode pretty fast. Um, so yeah, we're kind of like, there's just so much, that was like an overabundance of tools that you can play around with. So I guess it can have like a little bit of a, maybe I, I would caution people if they're just trying to like build something, they, wanna, they have a really cool idea for some, maybe like GPT wrapper kind of app I guess rappers a little bit dismissive, but like a, they, they want to build like a cool, something cool that uses completions or chat completions or just like uses LMs under the hood. I think right now, a lot of people, because there are so many open source projects, I don't know what to choose from. And I think a lot of people might go down like the Lang chain route or like some other, they'll try to clone a repo that is, you know, has a ton of stars and kind of does what they're trying to do, but not quite. I would just generally recommend because the tooling at like the base le level is so good, running your own models, having your own API servers running on your laptop or just using closed uh, APIs to kind of iterate on like OpenAI or Claude or whatever. I would recommend going that route because I think like the tooling has gone so good at the base layer that you can, a lot of the ideas you will have related to building AI applications, you can just do from scratch. And it's kind of faster to code these ideas 
from scratch often than try to like do some huge project that is already that already exists and kind of roll it back from there. Yeah. Well, one of the projects that you particularly right uh, have been working on recently is is MemGPT. So for the listeners who don't know much about the project or may have seen some other YouTube video or someone posts on Twitter, yeah. you know, could you give a an overview of, of what that is? So at a very high level, the, the point of MemGPT is in the name, like MemGPT as memory. It's basically to just give uh, LMs the ability to have long-term memory that doesn't get wiped as the context window basically gets evicted. So with most language models, they're backed by like, uh, transformers. They have a fixed context window, so they can only take a certain amount of text or tokens under the hood. And like the as of maybe a month ago, like best models you could get, open models would be like Llama two or something. And Llama two just off the shelf will have a four K context window, four K tokens, and that's only like a few dozen messages back and forth. If you're doing a chatbot style thing, so if you were actually trying to build out an application off of a four K context window model. You have to think about like what you're going to do when the conversation gets past a few dozen messages. Um, very common things to do are you just kind of summarize the message history as you go forward, and you like are always kind of cutting back. You reach 4K, then you cut back to 1K, like a summarization. You reach 4K, cut back to 1K. And MemGPT is about you know, more high-level principled approach to dealing with this problem of uh, just the fundamental issue of transformers with fixed context. And to go a little bit into the details, the idea is you. You basically just make the language model itself self-aware that it has a limited context window. So these tricks I'm talking about where you like kind of cut back, summarize, or maybe you have a vector database and you pull in all the recent stuff, um, or sorry, all the most relevant stuff, maybe not the most recent stuff, so that you kind of give the illusion of infinite context. These are all ways you can um, add engineering on the side of an L of a large language model to give this illusion of infinite context. But with MemGPT, the approach is quite different. Instead, it, you're not, there's no illusion. You're just very straightforward with the language model and you tell it in its own instructions, you are going to run out of context at some point. And you have a set of tools that you can use to manage your memory. And you just, you can decide what the algorithm is for your own memory management. Um, so I think it's kind of, it's in the same vein as a lot of how a lot of ways that the prompt engineering has kind of changed over time. I think we're noticing that maybe a year ago, you had a lot of, Kind of prompt engineering, prompt whisper hacks you could do where like if you wanted to get this answer from GPT-4 for this task, you'll do like X, Y, and Z and you'll have this crazy JSON thing inside your prompt. But these days, I think a lot of the prompts that people use are very much just the natural language instructions for the, the LM. So you just treat the GPT-4 like it's an, a human assistant. You just tell it in very uh, normal English, uh, English text what it needs to do. And it's the same principle with MemGPT. Instead of coding all of this memory management for MemGPT, for a language model, you just tell the language model, here's the tools, just so you know, you're, you have limited memory and you can code your own algorithm to, or you can make your own algorithm to manage the memory yourself. Yeah. I mean, that it's kind of scary, right? That now these models have this, I don't know if you want to call it awareness, but just like the ability to prompt it in such a way that it kind of has a pseudo awareness and it can yeah. take your instructions. It can uh, know its own limitations <laughs> and then kind of like work around, around that. So to me, it's, it's, I, it's so mind boggling that it's, we're at this point that this is a thing that, that we're now programming against. Yeah. I think it's pretty, it is pretty interesting when you think about it, you're basically just raising the level of abstraction one more time, like a self editing transformer. Wow. I also think that it probably, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, MemGPT is one kind of implementation of this idea, but I think this general idea of just not like making your LMs more self-aware of what's going on, um, of the programming that you yourself as, as an engineer are adding to the system. I think these are general ideas that probably will be pretty pervasive in language models going forward. One of the things that you pointed out that I think is actually, you can categorize it as, let's just call it the more engineering approach to, to solving things, right? If you uh, take the self-driving car example, right? There are more or less kind of falls under one of two buckets, right? One is the pure deep learning approach where you, know, you just feed it in data and it will output the steering acceleration, the, the, the control, right? Versus the more like engineered 
approach to like, okay, you're going to have a perception system, you're going to have a mapping system, a uh, prediction system, and they're, they're all independent of one another. They're modularized that way. And you can kind of you know, still achieve a similar outcome, but you just have more of these like moving parts. Now you're describing how for language models or at least for people coding uh, or building on top of these, that we're also seeing this type of like behavior as well, right? There are a lot of these new infrastructure pieces like vector databases coming out. There's these patterns like retrieval augmented generation that's saying like, hey, yeah, you want to minimize hallucinations. Well, you can just directly insert relevant context into your prompts. Well, I guess the question to you is, what would you say is the, the direction that actually could very well be the, of, of how AI will go? Are we going to see more engineered approaches or are we going to actually see, especially as these models get better and better, or you are still whispering, <laughs> doing the AI whispering and and trying to manage that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's kind of a mix of both. So right now, I, I would say you see a lot of this memory management stuff that clearly exists in production applications for a lot of these language models. Like there are chatbot applications where they clearly have to get around like the um, fixed context window problem. And, but it's a consumer app. They're not saying yes is like the, the, the consumer doesn't know about transformers and they're doing like a ton of engineering, a ton of plumbing behind the scenes to get this working. And I think to get the level of, to get to the level of MemGPT, where you have this meta approach where the language model knows everything that's going on and it's calling tools to kind of address the problems, you do need very good instruction following. And I think if you're doing some sort of like cost optimization on your inference and you really want to serve like a production app that has like good margins or something, you might not want to serve a model that that necessarily is that big or require is like big enough that it can do that instruction following. And it might be more beneficial for you to just kind of hack around it. But then at the same time, I do see the, the general direction of these models is they will just get better, better and better at instruction following. They might, I'm not very convinced that they will cross this like uncanny valley of utility where like right now, if you play with projects like Autogen or like chat dev, that's chat dev, but like where you have agents that talk to each other, I think you'll immediately notice that like if you just make GPT-4 talk to GPT-4, talk to GPT-4, it often doesn't look very good. It's, it looks much worse than if you're just talking to GPT-4 yourself. And it needs a lot of like goading to push things in the right direction. And I'm not sure if like the models will really become good enough or like go past this uh, uncanny valley of utility where they suddenly now you throw them all together in a pit and they come up with like a new startup idea that's absolutely genius and they actually code it out from scratch. That like... I think might be similar to the problem of self-driving where you have like this tail end that's just extremely hard and it's not clear how we're actually ever going to solve it, right? I still think that you can get agents that are self-aware, have this like meta functionality where they can manage their own context, manage their own memory, manage their own like database for they can manage their own rag without getting over that that cliff or that hump or whatever. So yeah, I think it, maybe the, the trend will just be overall more, more of these models are looking like MemGPT or looking more like meta where they're tool using, self-ragging, that kind of thing. But there's going to be certain use cases, especially like on the consumer side, I think, or even enterprise side where you want to serve really lean models for latency requirements, for cost requirements, whatever. And I don't think you can really pack this sort of instruction following into like a really tiny model. I think there's probably limitations to that. What would you say are some of the missing pieces for like, or like what problems haven't yet been fully solved uh, and are still quite open uh, in this space? Well, I think MemGPT, the, the memory issue is definitely not solved. It's not like MemGPT <laughs> solved it entirely. So Mem, MemGPT works really well at GPT-4. We're finding it is it's working surprisingly well with some of these Mishville fine tunes, but it's still far from perfect. And also like the the general ideas or the, the implementation of the ideas in Mem, from MemGPT are still maybe quite specific to chat in certain ways. And it's not necessarily just some super generalist solution you can apply to any transformer anywhere to give you infinite memory. I think this memory problem is still very much unsolved, but I, it also might be a thing that really doesn't have like one solution, depending on what you're trying to use LMs for, or you'll use it in different settings. Yeah, I'd say another problem that just isn't solved and I don't have a lot of hope that it will be solved completely satisfactory 
which is satisfactory point is the creativity with LMs thing. Um, so, you know, getting uh, somehow fine tuning a language model that can write new novels or new short stories that are just as good as what it was trained on, or, you know, you could win like a Pulitzer prize or whatever. Uh, yeah, I would say I'm not confident, not very confident that will happen, but I'm sure that the strides will be made in this general direction. But yeah, I think memory probably is like one of the biggest problems right now because it just it limits everything you do with LMs. And I think if people want to work on something that's going to be like really impactful with LMs, maybe it's like either uh, focus on tool use or memory. I think those two things like will have immediate impact for what people are building. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's it's one of those enabling technologies. If The more you can solve memory, I saw this right when the token window just doubled or in one case, right, when Anthropic released their latest, right, they made a 100K token window that it at least opened the realm of like new applications, new new ways to to use these, these things. And, but we we have seen that even with a 100K token window or even going beyond that, that it, it doesn't solve everything. And it sometimes even can introduce some weird quirks where like sometimes the the models will be better at attending to information that's at the beginning of the prompt and end of the prompt and like miss everything like that's in the middle just kind of weird things like that so yeah it certainly sounds like it's a continuing area of of, of research but one thing i wanted to hear your thoughts on is you know there's also just been this huge like hype hyper and and excitement and maybe like irrational exuberance in this in this space you know projects getting funded just by github stars to people becoming tiktok famous for just sharing oh like i got mid journey to to do this thing um and i'm not i'm not actually faulting people like people can go and, and make and do whatever they want people we all need to make a living somehow <laughs> but what i really wanted to dive into a bit more was all right you're talking a bit about uh, agents, right? And agents and, you know, these kind of auto programs or these AI that can make use of tools, act a bit autonomously. Well, like agents as a whole, as a, if you want to call it a class, right? They've been the the subject of like a huge amount of uh, interest, hype, attention. Do you feel that that is actually a, a way to go? Is there more reality uh, to it or it's still in this, you know, where there's more froth and more, more excitement than, than there's actual meat to how good agents are in a very like practical, you know, even like enterprise setting. I, I would say, I, I believe agents will have like a, a place where they have real value at. It's not just like all hype. Um, if anything, I think like the stuff around like kind of the, kind of these, these hype cycles are becoming so <laughs> compressed, right? So it's so the hype cycle we saw around images and image generation. I think the trickle down for what actually people are going like, to in the long run be using these things for um, is becoming more clear now, right? Uh, and maybe I think we're still AI generated video uh, starting to look better and better. Maybe we're like six months to a year away from it looking like really clean. And then maybe video will have more use cases and still images. We'll see. But I do think maybe out of this wave of hyper seeing into LLMs, there might be in the fallout more utility that uh, can be extracted. But I do think it's the, the comparison to self-driving is pretty apt because I think with like the full self-driving end-to-end you know, image to steering or like five, six images to steering, I think with that, we saw the first papers came out like Bojarski the NVIDIA paper, right? So when those first papers came out, it was like, okay, wow, you can, this is crazy, this works, and maybe we can get all the way with it. And I'm not really super up to date with like self-driving research, but my impression is that, it, you know, you can get, it feels like you're getting all the way, but then you hit this block at the end and it's like, okay, well, to actually extract all the utility is sitting in this long tail, and it's going to be incredibly hard actually to like get past that. And I, I think in self-driving, it's basically the safety of deploying the vehicles on the road with like this full end-to-end -end system. And I think with LMs, it's kind of similar because like you see how ChatGPT maybe can have incredible utility just as a Google, Google replacement. But like I said, when you start thinking about like agents, so maybe then you have ideas. I've heard this a lot where it's like, okay, what if we just put these agents together and they come up with their own company or we can like have companies that are run by agents, that sort of thing. 
And I think it's similar to self-driving where you start to, if you do then go that route, you put these agents together, the dream kind of falls apart and you realize <laughs> you start to see that's incredibly difficult to get to that like promised land where all the, all this, uh, you know, utility lies that you want to get out of LLMs. But I think with LLMs, there's a lot along the way that's like kind of in the middle where you can still extract a lot of value. So for, I think there's a lot of stuff that can be automated by language models, a lot of like background tasks, like managing like aspects of your data, streaming data, emails, just pulling up relevant documents, kind of search, enterprise search type of things. I think LLMs have a lot of promise for. But yeah, to get back to your original question, like maybe like what about this hype about agents like, taking over the world, you know, capitalist agent, <laughs> agent um, companies and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I, I would say if you like are really into that, just try putting, having GPT-4 talk to GPT-4 uh, for a little bit and just see what happens. Um, I think maybe your hype will cool a little bit. Yeah. It's one where having witness hype cycles, you know, we, we've seen it in autonomous, we've seen it in uh, crypto, we've seen it in, you know, now with AI, I, I think there will be some, there, there will inevitably be some fallout and, and then probably more likely consolidation of ideas, consolidation of approaches. And yeah, well, it's just a matter of seeing which ones actually will like be enduring, which ones will stand the test of time and not just uh, be caught up in, in the hype. Well, one thing that I would love to hear also from you is just, you know, I think a lot of people, especially those who may be entering the field for the first time, or just like they want to, but they just, they're so overwhelmed with so much content that's out there or, yeah. you know, all the different directions that they could go. If you were to even like, let's say, talk to young Charles Packer, right, as he is right, just starting school and trying to figure out what, what to study, what sort of advice would, would you give him? Yeah, if it was for the like right now, I think if you're interested in uh, doing AI research or AI ML engineering or something in industry, I think my number one advice would just be to actually just play around with this stuff. It, obviously you can't download like the GPT-4 wave onto your computer or anything, but you can, like everything is um, pretty easy to use right now. And I think it's really hard. There's just so much noise. It's very hard to understand what the real challenges are, what things work, what things don't, unless you just try it yourself. It's impossible to parse through all the noise. Maybe if you have a close friend who is an AI, kind of, you can ask them questions and they can give you maybe some more filtered feedback on what they think is promising or not. But I really just think the best way to get involved is just to see if you're really interested in LMs, just like maybe check out like what LMs, local local LMs are really hot right now and just see like what people are doing with that. Um, go check out like the, the big discords and stuff or GitHub repos. And I think as soon as you just start to use this stuff, use this tech um, yourself for trying to achieve like any sort of task, you'll realize very quickly like, what the limitations are, what you need to do. Or like what needs to be done to like kind of get to some LM dream or something that, <laughs> that you have. Yeah. And well, kudos to you for putting MGPT out. And, and I know you're also growing a, its own like Discord community as well. Probably getting flooded with requests and yeah. and uh, a lot of great people coming in. So yeah, again, kudos for contributing that back to the ecosystem. Well, Charles, as we're winding down the time that we have, one thing that I want to you know give you the the chance to talk about is, you know, if you want to share about like how people can maybe get involved in MGPT, some of the low hanging fruits that's like, hey, we could get some help here, that would be awesome, or even just anything that maybe you want to give a shout out to, we'd love to give you this time to to do that. Yeah, I say if you're interested in. MGPT or these ideas of like perpetual chatbots. Um, yeah, I think probably MGPT right now is like, it's a very active project. So there's a lot of people trying it out. A lot of people who clearly kind of resonate with this perpetual chatbot idea or kind of very, maybe a different way to chat with your docs than like something like Llama Index or uh, more RAG style approaches. And yeah, there's been an incredible amount of interest in running, like binding MGPT with your local local language models that you're running on, on pod, on your computer, on your MacBook, whatever. Um, but as soon as you start to do local models, 
Like, there's a million different things you can do. There's like a million different models, a ton of different settings. So I think what we're trying to do right now as like in the community on like Discord is just find what models work best with MemGPT. And that's like very much been a community effort so far. So there's people contributing like wrappers for different models, testing out, you know, like when a Zephyr beta came out, I think there are people who immediately tested it with MemGPT. And um, I think that's super cool. So if you want to get involved in that, I, it's, it's like super active right now. And it's really fun too, because it's crazy like how powerful models you can run on your own computer these days. Nice. Well, definitely check that out. Uh, link will be on the description to join the Discord. Well, Charles, I mean, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for taking a, a bit out of your busy schedule to, to join the Humans of AI podcast. And yeah, super excited to see uh, what comes out of you and, and the rest of the, the project. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Hey, thanks for listening to Humans of AI. If you're building something with AI or have perspectives you want to share, drop me a note at alex at humansofai.xyz. And be sure to subscribe to my newsletter, Chaos Theory. Until next time, this is Alex, Resident Chaos Coordinator.